Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 whacks. When she'd seen what she had done, she gave her father 41. Join me today as we talk about Lizzie Borden on Walk With History from Falls River, Massachusetts. one of the most famous Victorian murders. And what is interesting about this is you have these conflicts going on. You have conflict of class because this is an upper class family, it's an upper class murder. And then the working class is investigating this murder. The police, the investigators are all working class people. Then you're gonna have a gender gap issue here. So male investigators, male journalists, and a female suspect, a female upper class woman suspect. And I'm out in front of the Lizzie Borden house. And this was owned by Andrew Borden. And in 1845, Falls River is a textile city. A lot of immigrants live here. You have people who are lower class, especially in this area. But what is going on is Andrew Borden is a property developer. And he is made, he's a self-made man who's made money developing property in the area. And even though they're upper class, they don't really live in an upper class area. They live around where their work is. He lives around, because he comes home for lunch. So he wants to live around where he works and what he does. So this is their home. It was on a busy street here. It was on a busy street then. On August 4th, 1892, is when the murder happens in this 92. It's a Thursday. And what the investigators were able to surmise is that the stepmother, Abby, was killed first at 9 a.m. in the upstairs bedroom. She got 19 blows to the back of the head. They do believe that she was hit from the front and knocked over, and then the 19 blows happened behind her. And that is a very personal way to kill somebody. And we'll go more in depth into more specifics about this. And then at 11 a.m., Andrew comes home for lunch. And it's at 11 a.m. that he is killed downstairs in with a similar object. So the object is a bladed object, a sharp bladed object, like an ax, although a weapon was never found. Lizzie Borden will be arrested on August 11th because there's only four people home that day. Five people live in the house, Emma, Lizzie, their maid, Bridget, who they call Maggie, and Abby Borden, stepmother, and Andrew Borden, father. The relationship is strained between the stepmother and the two daughters. They are, I would say, spinsters at the time in their 30s and 40s. And that morning, Lizzie Borden sends Maggie out to watch the windows because the doctor testifies during the for the autopsy that when she hit the ground, Abby upstairs, it would have been so loud, it would have shaken the house. And how could Lizzie not have heard it? How could Lizzie not have, and how could Bridget not have heard it? Well, Bridget, Maggie, the maid was outside cleaning the windows. And Lizzie has all these changing stories that she was embroidering, that she was sewing, things along that nature. Andrew Borden wants to live close to his job. Right, he's a, he's a property developer here. So he's selling factories and areas to the textile workers. And he wants to be close to work so he can come home for lunch, which he does that day on August 4th, 1892. At the time, Lizzie Borden is 32. Her older sister, Emma, is 41. And he's very tight-fisted with his money. You know, he's self-made. So a lot of people at that time would be self-made and tight-fisted. So Lizzie Borden and Emma are given kind of an allowance and because they're 32 and 41, they are considered pretty much old maids at that time. But they almost feel like prisoners in their home. Now, Andrew Borden is their father. Abby Borden is their stepmother. Their real mother died many years ago when Emma was 14 and Lizzie was five. So he's been married to Abby Borden for over 20 years and they really don't even talk. They really don't even interact with each other. Actually, Andrew Borden will gift a house to Abby's sister and Lizzie and Emma get so upset. Andrew and Abby will start locking their bedroom door at night. And Lizzie will move furniture to block the door between her and her father and stepmother's room. So the biggest 
gender gap you're going to see in this case is when the male investigators come to investigate, the only flushing toilet is in the basement. When they go down to the basement, they find a bucket of bloody rags. Lizzie Borden will say when they find that bucket that it's her period. And <laughs> there's no faster way to scare men away than to say it's my period. And so they don't even look in that bucket. They don't even investigate that bucket. They're like an upper class woman. And she's, men she's mentioning her menstrual period. Oh my gosh, it's completely not looked at then. Uh, so here you, you're seeing this gender gap. Now, as much as that gender gap is present, Lizzie Borden is still gonna be prosecuted as a suspect in this case. Second Street is a busy street here in Fall River. And it was busy then, it's busy now. So five people live in this house, like I said before. Andrew Borden, his wife, Abby Borden, stepmother, to Lizzie Borden and Emma Borden. Emma, who's 41, Lizzie, who's 32, and the maid, Bridget, who they call Maggie. Bridget Sullivan, Irish maid, who they call Maggie. Five people live in this house. On August 4th, 1892, only four people would be in the house. Now, in the morning, it's just Abby, Lizzie, and Bridget. Emma's visiting friends, Andrew's at work. Bridget is sent outside to wash the windows and people see her outside washing the windows, so she has an alibi. Lizzie never really has an alibi. At 9 a.m. is when they claim, the autopsy uh, examiner claims that Abby is killed upstairs, blow to the front, knocking her over, and then the wax, the 19 blows to the head with a sharp bladed object. And then 11 a.m., Andrew comes home for lunch, downstairs sitting on the couch he's given 11 whack same thing to the head lizzie claims she comes in at 11 to tell her father that lunch is ready and she sees him slumped over the chair and she gets really upset and she screams for maggie for bridget and maggie comes in and she goes send for the doctor i think something's wrong with dad she doesn't go in the room again she's playing this upper crust value if you came across something so shocking and send for the doctor well maggie goes out can't find the doctor but she finds her neighbor and so the neighbor comes in and that's when lizzie says where's my stepmother and it's maggie and the neighbor who go upstairs and find Abby upstairs. And then when the investigators are called and they come in, the crime scene gets very di um, diluted because everyone's walking around and everyone, they don't know what to do. The police have never really had to deal with this type of crime with this class of family. So they don't really know what to do at the time. And they investigate the house and that's when they find the bucket of rags down by the toilet downstairs. So I just finished the tour of the Lizzie Borden house. I recommend doing it because that's how you get to see all the rooms and everything. That's where the stepmother was killed. So at like around nine o'clock and then, and then she's 11 a.m. So another piece of the puzzle was the brother, so Lizzie and Emma Borden's first, their mother, Andrew Borden's first wife, had a brother, and the brother was very interested in their lives and kept in contact with them. He visited here that day that they were killed. He had stayed overnight that night that they were killed, but he had left early in the morning, ran some errands, and got back here about two o'clock, and he had receipts for every place that he had been and he knew exactly the people he had talked to. His alibi was just like really good. So people think maybe he helped Lizzie uh, in killing these people because remember Emma's gone. Lizzie also burns a dress and I took a picture of the furnace. Lizzie actually burns a dress about five days after and I took a picture of that furnace so you can see that as well. But if you have a chance to take the tour or stay in the house, I recommend it. So as you can see, I took some video of the gift shop and they have overnight stays and that's 10, top 10 haunted places in America. Ooh, I haven't seen anything yet. I haven't seen anything in the windows, we'll see. I've been in the most haunted places in America and I haven't seen anything there either. I've been in the most haunted house in America. Oak Grove Cemetery is really beautiful, but you see these arrows on the ground that say LB. So just when you come in the front of Oak Grove Cemetery, it's just like when you come in to the cemetery where Lucille Ball is and it has the hearts that lead you to it. These arrows, LB, Lizzie Borden, when you drive in, it'll lead you directly to her grave. And here is her father. So this is Andrew Jackson Borden. This is 
the man who was killed at 11 o'clock. So children of Andrew and Sarah Borden, that's the first wife, Alice, Esther, the little girl who dies at one year old. There's Elizabeth Andrews, <laughs> that's Lizzie Borden, 1860, 1927, and Emma Lenora. They die within a week of each other, actually. Uh, Lizzie, I think, dies of pneumonia. Emma will die of a stroke. And 1851 to 1927, so here's their children. And then here's Andrew Jackson Borden, 1892. Of course, his wife, Abby uh, Dupree, Dupree Borden, also 1892, and Sarah Anthony is his first wife. Now, we've talked about this before, where the marker will be in one place and the actual tombs will be in another. This is probably her tomb right here. This is Emma. This is probably where she's actually buried. And then over here, we have Alice. Alice is the little girl. Sarah, then Andrew Jackson, and then Abby. So he's buried. Then his second wife, first wife, their little girl, and then Lisbeth and Emma right there. There we are. Very easy to find. Again, take the arrows, walk up, the marker for the Borden family, and then the graves right off to the side. After the trial, she buys a very nice house in the nice area of town. She buys a house next door for somebody who testified in her defense, an actual seamstress who testifies in her defense. And she lives out her life there, and she takes care of family. She buys them food. Uh, she takes care of like 12 different families and she actually tends sends two kids to college from those families. She t gives a ton of money to the Humane Society. So much money to the Humane Society, they still use the grant from her today. She just lives out the rest of her life, uh, never marries. She did more than likely commit this murder. And it's interesting about this case is there's 12 male jurors on this case and 11 of them are Protestant, same as Lizzie Borden, and they're English Protestant. They don't even live in Fall River and they take 55 minutes to find her innocent. And it's basically just this male idea that a woman couldn't commit this heinous murder. A woman couldn't do this. There's no way. And Lizzie Borden, every day for the trial, dresses up and looks the part of an upscale woman. She makes sure that she's living this role of an upscale woman. Like, how could you think I could even do something like this? It's like today, we're so obsessed with looking behind the curtain of different types of people and their lifestyles. Like, there's certain trials that people will gravitate towards to watch a lot of because it's just a different lifestyle to us and we want to see it. Same thing with Lizzie Borden, upscale lifestyle of the Victorian era. You know, there's a lot of class politics here, there's a gender politi politics here that are working in her favor. And she is not, not unaware that that is working in her favor she plays that up. She's using that for her. So as much as women in the Victorian era don't have the vote, don't really have a say, she is working within the confines that she has. She uses that to her advantage and probably got away with murder. On to my next Walk With History.